All right, thank you for your patience. I know there's a lot, been a lot of shuffling today and I wanted to make sure we get going because I um, this was actually a topic that was suggested by uh, patients who attended last year's conference to look at both medication side effects and vaccination. So this was a new presentation that I prepared based on you know talking to some people in the audience we'll see how it fits with what i think people who suggested it were imagining you know we can always tweak it later but i want to make sure we have enough time for questions because i know there's going to be some things that we probably should have covered a little bit more in detail on this based on what i'm hearing from the audience um so let's get going okay so um just full disclosure, consultant for Caballetta Bio that's doing some of the CAR T cell trials. Okay, and the objectives of this talk, it's not going to be to tell you every single side effect of every medication that would be extremely boring and not applicable to um, many of you in the audience, but it's to really develop a framework for how to talk to your doctors about this. And part of the reason I was excited to do this topic too is because when, you know, I'm at Northwestern in Chicago and, you know, clinic visits for us are long, which means for us is 30 minutes for patients with scleroderma, for patients without scleroderma, we have 20. And that's a very, very short time to not only go over side effects, talk about updates, talk about what we need to talk about, but a lot of times what we miss is this general framework for how do we even, how do you even conceptualize the medication side effects? How do you make sense of what you read online? How do you think about whether or not you should be on a medication? You know, if you listen to some of these commercials for some of these medications that are FDA approved, successful in clinical trials, blockbuster therapies, and it says, you know, you may experience death and dementia, you know, I mean, it's like, whoa, you know, why, why am I taking this, right? So it's, you know, I think the information that you get, sometimes it's either too much or not enough, but there's no real framework for really how to interpret it in the sense of, you know, in the context of treating your condition. So we're going to talk about key concepts for how do we assess medication risk. We're going to talk about some classes of medications that are used that many of you will be on and some general categories of side effects and how to minimize that risk. So there are some things that you can actually do to try to talk to your doctor about to see if, yes, this risk exists, but can we cut the risk a little? And then at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about vaccinations. And it's going to be fairly brief, but talk about how you can know what vaccinations to get, and then also how to know how vaccinations help people with scleroderma. Okay, so part one is going to be like mini medical school. So in medical school, we have a, a whole class, and I think it went on for one or two years, called medical decision making. I think we had 101 and 102. And it's we, we do it for two years, right? And I'm going to condense it into like 20 minutes. And so, <laughs> so we're going to see how it goes. Um, and we're going to talk about just how do we think about these things, right? Like how do you conceptualize risks versus benefits, risks of the medication versus risks of the condition? And then part two is actually going to be going into those classes of medications and talking about the common side effects of some commonly used medications and then potential ways that we can intervene and say, can we minimize that risk? And then part three is vaccinations. So medical decision-making 101, assessing risk. And these are gonna be some key concepts. So one concept that was never in medical decision-making, but I think is really important is the medication pendulum. So it's very common for medications to be on a pendulum. They come out and everyone thinks this is the greatest thing since like spread or someone starts to market it and says, everybody should be on this. They should put it in the water. You know, remember, you know, 15 years ago, I was told pain is the sixth vital sign. We under treat pain. Everybody needs to be on an opioid. Okay, that was in medical school. I was taught that. Now it's very different, right? We went to the other end of the pendulum where you can't get narcotics without, you know, going through, you know, dual factor authentication and getting a, basically scrutinized by the government. Okay. Statins are another one. You know, statins should be in the water. Statins have so many side. So there's, there's lots of things that have swung back and forth. The truth is usually somewhere in the middle. It's not, you know, most medications are not for everyone. The, in an ideal world, we would all be healthy. We'd be on no medications throughout our entire life, but that is actually a rare situation. Most people throughout their lives are gonna need something to stay healthy. And so how do you pick the something with the least amount of risk, 
How do you minimize those risks? And when can you say that the potential side effects of the medication are worth it because they're helping me live better, they're helping me live longer. And it's about picking the right medication for the right patient. So there's the concepts of absolute versus relative risk. You'll hear this a lot if you're you know, reading about studies, you hear this medication triples the risk of heart attack or triples the risk of death, something like that. And that sounds very, very scary. But then you have to ask yourself, what is the actual risk? Because if the risk is one in a million, that's gonna mean something very different for how you think about that medication, even though yes, it may increase your risk, but if that risk is still really, really rare, I think we have to put that in context. So the absolute risk is the actual risk. So that's actually, you know, 10% of people get a serious infection on this medication, you know, you know, one in 10,000 people, you know, get lymphoma. Um, the relative risk is how it compares. So sometimes when you're reading or hearing articles, you have to think about, are they talking about absolute risk, the actual risk, or are they talking about relative risk? And it is important to know both. You need to know how that medication affects the chance compared to somebody who's not on it. And you need to know what is the actual risk, those two key components, okay? So, and again, you know, that example of lymphoma is a really scary complication, but you know, if it's super, super rare, I think you need to have that information to know how you frame that risk. So here's a visual illustration of why the absolute risk matters. Okay, so medication A is in green and the placebo, the sugar pill, let's say, is in purple. So medication A in both of those graphs doubles your risk. So if you look on the left, the infection risk at baseline is low. And you can see it doubles your risk, but there's hardly a change in the absolute risk, right? There's still many, many people that don't get an infection. Now, if the risk is higher at baseline and you double that risk, now you're seeing you went from 20% of people getting an infection to 40%. That's a big, big deal. That's a lot more people getting infections. And so part of it is when you look at this, you can still have the same thing that can say double your risk, but it means something very different when that absolute risk is already different. Okay, the next concept that I know many of you are already at least somewhat familiar with is causation versus correlation or association. So when we see a negative outcome rise in association with a medication, we can't necessarily assume that the medication is the cause. So if you go and look at medication side effects, so you may find drugs.com or some of these are you know, reputable institutions that put out lists of here are the side effects of this medication. Many of these are things that were seen in post-marketing data. So after the medication was approved out to market, they were seen in association with it it does not necessarily mean that the medication directly caused those things. You know, I'll put the example of mycophenolate. You'll go on drugs.com, you'll see mycophenolate causes tachycardia, causes fast heart rate. Well, mycophenolate is not a heart medication. We don't use that to speed up people's heart rate. It is an immune suppressant and potentially people with immune suppressants can get infections, other things that can lead people to have an elevated heart rate, right? So there are, it's not always a direct pathway from medication to side effect. And, you need to know, is it due to the underlying condition that somebody has, you know, maybe their condition progressed and there was some complication related to that. And that's why they were on mycophenolate in the first place. Um, and then people are not on just one medication, people are on many medications, right? And so when someone's taking medication, they may have a side effect of another medication, but when it's reported, it's reported as being in association with that medication. So you just have to be careful about how you interpret some of that information. And so here's the pathway for correlation would be like a triangle. Okay. So, you know, for example, an illness is getting worse. And so because that illness, like, for example, interstitial lung disease may be getting worse. And because of that, mycophenolate was started. Okay. And then because of that, you know, because the illness was getting worse, maybe someone developed digital ulcers, right? Mycophenolate didn't cause digital ulcers, but maybe the ulcer started after they were started on mycophenolate just because the illness was getting worse. That's correlation, right? That's not a direct pathway. A causative association would be when there's a medical problem worsening, someone gets started on a medication and there's a direct side effect. Like someone gets started on mycophenolate for interstitial lung disease and they get an infection. That's a direct side effect of microphenol. 
So nobody's going to give you this, you know, is it a triangle or is it a line? You have to kind of figure that out yourself. So how do you figure that out? And we will get to that. So here's another example of correlation versus association. So this is real. So people who quit smoking, quit smoking, are 26% more likely to die of respiratory disease in the next five years compared to people who continue smoking. So does this mean that you should continue smoking <laughs> if you have respiratory disease? Absolutely not. No. So you know, part of it is that what this shows is that there's a correlation. So people who got sick from the respiratory disease may have been too sick to smoke. They have been maybe hospitalized or maybe they got a wake up call and said, well, my lung disease is getting really bad. I better quit. And both of those happened. Both those things happened. Someone quit smoking and someone had another problem or, you know, got worse from their respiratory disease because their respiratory disease was getting worse. So you should still quit smoking, right? Um, that's just a correlation. Okay, so how do we know? The best source of information for whether a medication causes a side effect or whether it's association, associated would be a randomized placebo control trial. And so that's where you actually take the medication and you compare it to something that is just like it, but doesn't have the active medication. So for example, if you had an injection, you would have to compare it to another injection. Or if you had a pill, you'd have to compare it. You know, we often call sugar pill, though they're not really made of sugar anymore. And so that's a good way to know, you know, how many people on this medication got this side effect versus how many people on the sugar pill. And you'd be surprised. People on sugar pill get a lot of side effects. And people on the sugar pill get a lot of benefits as well. So you really have to do those randomized trials to know. The other way to know is, is there a biological rationale for the side effect? So when we say that something, you know, is potentially a side effect, is there a way that we conceptualize that that might work? So again, you know, going back to mycophenolate and rapid heart rate, you know, is mycophenolate a heart rate drug? No, not really. So it's, you know, you have to have an idea of a way that that might happen. The other way to know is, is there dose dependence? So if you have greater medication exposure, you're on a higher dose for a longer period of time, does that increase your risk incrementally of developing that side effect? So if you know that the more medication you're on, the higher likelihood of that side effect, then potentially it is. It doesn't mean it is, but that's one of the things that we use is dose dependence. The other thing that's really important for a patient is temporal association, time association. So when did the problem start versus when was the medication started? So if the problem started before the medication started, we know the medication didn't cause it, right? You know, you could kind of hypothesize that maybe it made it worse or maybe it made it better. You know, it's hard to say, but we know that that wasn't the original cause because the side effect or the issue happened even before, okay? And then the other thing is a strong, consistent and or specific association. So we do this in clinic all the time. So sometimes we don't know exactly whether something's a side effect of a medication or whether it's because of the scleroderma. And so when we say, you know, for a person to person level, when we talk about a strong, consistent, specific association, you know, let's say for example, you're on, you know, again, we'll go back to mycophenolate. Let's say on mycophenolate and you're having diarrhea, okay? So mycophenolate can be a side effect or diarrhea can be a side effect of the mycophenolate but it could also be from scleroderma, right? So how do you know? Sometimes we say, let's have you go off of it for a week or two, okay? And then you go off of it. Let's say diarrhea doesn't get better. Probably not from the mycophenolate then because we, we went off it. But what if you go off the mycophenolate, the diarrhea gets better. Then we say, well, let's try to reintroduce the mycophenolate. Diarrhea gets worse again. You come off of it, it gets better, right? It's a strong, consistent association. You know, in medical literature, it means something else. You want to see multiple studies that show the same association. But for a person, that's good evidence, right? I went, I went on mycophenolate, it caught, I got diarrhea. I went off mycophenolate, the diarrhea went away. I went back on, I got diarrhea again, right? That sounds like a side effect. Okay, so placebo effect. We touched on it a little bit. It is a real biological effect. So it is not in someone's head. It, this is the reason what we do these trials. So when we even do, you know, there's things that shouldn't be, you know, related to, you know, our own perceptions, things like lung capacity that we would think that should be totally independent of 
you know, whether there's a placebo involved, but there is an effect still, even on things like lung function, we see a placebo effect. So it's a real biological effect. And we talked about sometimes, you know, in the past, you see actual sugar pills. Now, the, you know, placebo pills have different compositions. There was one study where people on placebo got a lot of stomach side effects, and it turns out that placebo irritated people's stomachs. So, it is, you know, placebo, they're really, really important. And there's a lot of thought goes into how do you construct a placebo that kind of looks exactly like something that is the active therapy. What's interesting about the placebo effect is that the placebo effect varies based on the kind of placebo. And so one of the, you know, the things many of you may get knee injections, there's a very strong placebo effect for knee injections. Now there's also an effect beyond the placebo effect, but there's a really profound pain relieving effect of sticking a needle in something, especially taking a needle in a joint. So it's really, it's really interesting. And if you deliver a placebo in a high tech environment, so someone you know, it's going to be different if someone gives you, you know, a pill in a clinic room versus if somebody gives you a pill in an operating room with, you know, high tech equipment all around you, the type of environment actually matters for how effective that placebo is. And then injections have a stronger placebo effect than pills. So, and, you know, if you pay more, it's actually been shown too, that if you pay more for something, it has a stronger placebo effect. I'm not saying you should pay more for things to try to get, and if you know about the placebo effect, it still works. So knowing that something is a placebo does not get rid of the placebo effect. So this is a great example, right? So Raynaud's is a condition, you know, we all know about Raynaud's pain. Um, Raynaud's is a condition that's very susceptible to the placebo effect. And so, you know, for example, here again, we have medication A in green and medication, uh, the placebo in purple. And so what you see is if you didn't have a placebo, you thought medication A was great, right? Here, you know, it reduces your Raynaud's episodes by more than, you know, 50%, but the placebo also does. Um, I will have to say, this is something that we saw in the clinical trials of Botox for Raynaud's. So there was a trial done by Scott Lifshay at Johns Hopkins, where they did one hand with Botox, one hand with normal saline. The Botox hand looked great, but so did the placebo. So it is, again, you know, this is the importance of knowing what is the actual data, how does it compare to something that is supposed to be biologically inert. Okay, so where do you get good information? I would love to say your rheumatologist, you know, and I'm biased, but I do think people with scleroderma should ideally be seen by somebody who sees a lot of people with scleroderma in a scleroderma center. Um, and the NSF does, you know, they've been working hard on publishing a list of kind of scleroderma centers and what they do and what their level of expertise is with clinical care and with clinical trials and things like that. But it's important to be seen by somebody who knows the disease process. And ideally, if you can have multiple people who know about scleroderma, that's even better. GI, you know, home, um, patient education materials from reputable organizations, um, American College of Rheumatology, the Arthritis Foundation, National Scleroderma Foundation, um, and then randomized placebo control trials. I do, you know, it, it, these things, if you, if you have insomnia, a good way to cure it is by reading medical journals. But it is, I do think actually, you know, the good way to look at these trials, you know, go back and ask the doctor for that trial. The, what is the trial that led to the approval? Why are we using this? And look at the tables and the tables you can read it is and you know the the actual text of it is is always going to be a little bit heavy but i do think the tables can give you a good summary of what would i expect on this medication in a smaller group so key concepts it's very important to know how common a side effect is especially if a medication increases the risk okay so that's talking about these concepts of absolute versus relative risk and then saying an adverse outcome increases in people on a medication does not necessarily prove that the medication is the cause. You need to think about the things of, you know, what is correlation versus what is causation. And then look to those placebo controlled trials when possible to help figure out the risk versus benefits. Okay. So the next part is gonna start out light and then we're gonna get a little bit more into the details. Okay, so common medication side effects and how to reduce risk. Okay, these are shots from my garden, which is actually suffering this year because we, um, the cicadas, oh my gosh, I don't, the, this is the Midwestern problem. We have the, the brood of cicadas that just destroyed a lot of things. Okay, so general strategies to grow your health garden. Exercise. 
I love exercise, right? So when we're talking about how do we minimize side effects, one of the things that we're talking about is let's do everything we can to try to maximize the health benefits of our lifestyle. And that is not going to be the cure for scleroderma at all, but it's, it's a foundation, right? It's something that you can do to, you know, maximize things. And let's say, let's, let's try to minimize how much medication we're still probably going to need something. Um, but these are things you can do. So exercise, I love exercise. It actually has been shown to reduce the risk of serious complications of viral infections like COVID. And so it not only helps protect your lungs from infection somewhat, but it also has some immunomodulatory benefits. And the sweet spot is really 30 to 45 minutes a day. So we don't, you know, for people who are already triathletes and marathon runners, I'm not going to tell you not to do that. But I would not say you need to go run a marathon. You know, if you can go out and go for a brisk walk for 30 to 45 minutes, that actually hits that sweet spot of having immune changing effects while not increasing your risk of infections. Marathons can actually be a little pro-inflammatory. Um, so I don't necessarily uh, recommend like super long exercise unless you, you love to do that. Um, breathe only clean air. So this is a big thing. I know marijuana, a lot of people love marijuana now. I say nothing smoked. So don't smoke anything, nothing into your lungs except for clean air, no vapes. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot you can do about air pollution, you know, but it is, you know, try to do what you can, you know, to maximize the clean air in your environment. Maintain a healthy weight. It, that does not mean, so this, Actually, there's a U-shaped mortality curve, U-shaped risk of death with BMI. The sweet spot is somewhere around 25 to 26, which is actually in a slightly overweight range. So you don't necessarily need to hit a target BMI. And for a lot of people, you know what? Your body is your body. So I, I'm not a big pusher on weight loss for people with scleroderma. Scleroderma can cause weight loss. You need to have good nutrition. You need to support your body. You know, and it is, if, you know, for some reason you talk to your doctor and your weight, you know, you, you think it should be down a couple pounds or whatever, um, there's ways to help achieve that. Okay. And stress reduction, life is stressful. That is not, there are some studies showing that like things like PTSD can increase the risk of autoimmune disease, but you can't control if you were traumatized, you know, it is all you can do is the things that you can do, right? Get good sleep, try to sleep at a reasonable bedtime try to wake up at a reasonable time, you know, eat healthy food, you know, try to, you know, minimize your stress in whatever way possible. Don't work too much. Um, and then Mediterranean style diet. There's a lot of people who, you know, have made claims about these autoimmune protocol call and getting rid of nightshades and getting rid of tomatoes and potatoes. And to me, like, it's so restrictive and it's so hard to live with scleroderma as it is. And then you add in this really restrictive diet and, you know, there's not a good reason to do that. The Mediterranean diet though, it's, it's fresh. It's basically vegetables, beans, lean meats, um, whole grains, you know, mix up your whole grains. Don't eat too much wheat, you know, kind of brown rice, quinoa, things like that. Um, Mediterranean diet has, still has good backing, you know, healthy fats, olive oil, um, nuts. So these types of things can help you reduce your infection risk, um, you know, reduce your cardiovascular risk, improve your bone and muscle health. And doing these things too can, you know, some of the medications you're using are going to increase your cardiovascular risk, right? You want to be doing everything you can to try to keep your body healthy um, so that you can minimize the risk of those side effects. So the categories we're going to go over are proton pumps inhibitors, so acid reflux medications, um, Raynaud's medications, which there are several, and then non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, corticosteroids like prednisone, and disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, which is a big category. And again, this is not supposed to be each medication, you know, we tell you everything about it, but this is general categories of things that many people will be on at some point. Um, and I will say, you know, we don't generally advise corticosteroids in people with scleroderma, but many people are on them. Okay. So proton pump inhibitors, PPIs. And so a lot of these end in azole. So if you see omeprazole, asomeprazole, which is basically just a different chemical formulation of omeprazole, lansoprazole, dexlansoprazole. Again, lansoprazole and dexlansoprazole are different chemical formulations of the same medication, essentially. Um, pantoprazole, rubeprazole, and these have brand names as well, but I'm going to use generics just to make it, you know, so we don't get confused because I know some people I'm not sure are um, out of the country too, where there's different names. So potential benefits, which I think is always important to talk about when we talk about side effects is not just what are the side effects, but why would someone be honest, right? 
um, cause it's a balance. So reducing heartburn symptoms, you know, for people, some people with acid reflux just get cough or sore throat and that can be from reflux. And so they can be used for that. There's a condition called Barrett's esophagus that can be worsened by chronic acid reflux and can turn into esophageal cancer. And in that case, it's really important for people to be on these medications to reduce irritation to the esophagus. Um, and then there's some people who put people's scleroderma on these medications to reduce the risk of lung disease because there is some data showing that if you have acid reflux, that even silent acid reflux may go into the lungs and you can breathe it in at night. Um, and that can potentially irritate the lungs. Um, so, and that's not quite, that, that data I think is fairly good that acid reflux can damage the lungs. Whether or not proton pump inhibitors help that, I think is still a matter of debate, but that is something that may be determined in some future study. So potential side effects. And I think, you know, a lot of these I think are truly positive. So decreased bone density, there is an association between um, proton pump inhibitors and osteoporosis. And the way that proton pump inhibitors may do that is by decreased absorption of vitamins and minerals. So magnesium can be lower. Magnesium is important for actually getting calcium into your bones. And so you can see people on proton pump inhibitors are more likely to have um, low magnesium. Um, increased risk of kidney problems. Again, I think this is real. So there are proton pump inhibitors, uh, there are proton pumps in the kidneys. And so, and there is a dose response effect where in certain PPIs have a higher risk than others. And this is not like, it's not typically something where the kidney function changes overnight. This is something where the kidney function can creep up over time. And so, um, uh, there is another potential, this is in the news lately, a possible increased risk of dementia. Keep in mind, there's, there's also studies associating having acid reflux alone with dementia. And I don't think that's a causative. So I think that's still a question mark, but one of the ways that potentially proton pump inhibitors may do, uh, may cause cognitive issues is they can decrease your absorption of vitamin B12. Um, and then increased risk of GI infections. We don't see a lot of GI infections in people on these, but it is, you know, acid in your stomach is supposed to be antibacterial. So how do you minimize the risk? So bone density scan. I think people with scleroderma, this is a really important thing because actually people with scleroderma are at higher risk of fracture anyway. So, and definitely if you're postmenopausal, it's recommended for everyone to get a bone density scan. Bone density in men, a little bit different. The guidelines are not as clear for bone density in men. Um, but most, you know, I think many people with scleroderma have risk factors for low bone density. So talk to your doctor about whether that would be something that may be eligible for you. A bone density scan, a DEXA scan, is a low dose x-ray of the hip and the lower back. So again, protecting your bone health, exercise. You know, those 30 to 45 minutes of walking. You don't have to do weights. So actually the mechanical loading from just pounding the pavement and walking on the ground is good for your bone health. You know, get three servings of calcium rich foods daily. If you can't get your three servings of calcium rich foods, ask your doctor about a supplement. Check your B12 levels. I think this is something we probably should do in everybody on a proton pump inhibitor. Check your B12. We find low B12, in, just in general, in people with scleroderma, we find low B12 quite a bit. Um, and so check your B12 levels to make sure that we're protecting your brain health as much as possible. We do check kidney function periodically. You know, most people with scleroderma are getting labs several times a year, but definitely if I'm prescribing someone a proton pump inhibitor, I usually say we need that kidney function at least once yearly, but most people are getting it more than that. And then, you know, again, it's one of those things, lots and lots of people are on proton pump inhibitors, which is why they're able to see some of these side effects that take a long time to see side effects. There's a thought that H2 blockers like pepsin um, may be safer but it may also be we don't have as much data and there's not as much focus on them. So you may find that they have some of the same, it's possible that they may end up having some of the same side effects, but sometimes we do try to do that. And so, you know, sometimes we have people reduce the dose if they can under supervision of your doctor, and then potentially, you know, try to use that H2 blocker as an ad, as needed medication to try to help manage the reflux. And I would also say one of the, you know, all the things that you can do healthy lifestyle to manage reflux. So the things, you know, kind of minimizing those acidic foods, you know, caffeine, alcohol, chocolate tend to be big triggers for people's reflux. Elevate the head of your bed by six inches using a wedge pillow or bed risers, because at night that'll help keep the acid in your stomach or lungs rather than going into your esophagus. Okay. So Raynaud's medications. 
So there are many. So there's class, there's a class called calcium channel blockers. So that would be amlodipine and nifedipine. Those are the most common ones we use. I don't prescribe diltiazem. Some doctors do prescribe diltiazem. Um, they're not quite as helpful as amlodipine and nifedipine. It's a different type of calcium channel blocker. Um, and then sometimes people are on sildenafil or chadalafil, which are called PDE5 inhibitors. Um, sildenafil, the brand name here is Viagra and Tadalafil Cialis. And then for people um, who can't tolerate, you know, typically amlodipine, nifedipine, um, sometimes we'll use uh, what's called an angiotensin uh, receptor blocker called Losartan. So potential benefits are they can improve brain out symptoms, really, really important, right? And so for people who are getting finger ulcers, especially maximizing that blood flow to the fingers is extremely important. And often in those cases, that's when I'm selecting sildenafil or tadalafil to try to really maximize the blood flow. They can lower the blood pressure. Um, I'd say amlodipine, nifedipine, and losartan are commonly used blood pressure medications as well. Um, we don't typically use diltiazem, sildenafil, or tadalafil for blood pressure. So amlodipine, nifedipine, and losartan have a little bit more impact on the blood pressure. And then diltiazem specifically can be used to lower heart rate. So I've seen, especially sometimes people will use diltiazem for Raynaud's when the heart rate is high because they want to get a, a heart rate lowering effect too. Um, and it's something that we do see people try. But. So potential side effects, really, really common headache and leg swelling. So especially amlodipine and nifedipine, they are notorious for causing leg swelling. And it may be you go out and you're in the heat, your ankles are swollen. And I, you'd be surprised how often people come in with leg swelling and nobody ever thinks about the amlodipine and nifedipine, but it's really, really common. Um, they can lower blood pressure. For some people, that may be a good thing, right? If your blood pressure is high, this may be a desired side effect. Um, acid reflux is an issue. So these medications can work by relaxing smooth muscle. You have smooth muscle in your esophagus. And so the smooth muscle and relaxation in your blood vessels is a good thing. It's going to help get blood flow in there, help those vessels open. But smooth muscle relaxation in the esophagus is not always a good thing because it's going to uh, impact the ability of the esophagus to contract. So change in color vision, this is, um, it's, it's not a common side effect. We'll see it sometimes with high doses of sildenafil especially, but it is, um, and the ophthalmologists don't worry too much about this. It's a blue color vision. It's like a blue tint. And, you know, for some people they're like, I don't mind, it's kind of a nice color, but it's, a, it, and it does go away when you come off of it. Um, but it's a very unique side effect. And then losartan specifically can cause high potassium. Okay, so how do we minimize the risk? Everybody with scleroderma should have a blood pressure cuff. You can get one online. The Omron brand, I'm, I have no financial connections to Omron, but that's a good brand of blood pressure cuff. Um, and usually the arm cuffs are going to be better. You want to check your blood pressure with, with your feet flat on the floor, in a chair, relaxed, arm on a table, about at heart level. But everybody with scleroderma should have a blood pressure cuff. Well, There's really no exceptions because um, it's just really important. To, it's you know for cardiovascular health, kidney complications, um, and check it periodically. And especially if you're feeling lightheaded, check your blood pressure and make sure your blood pressure is not going too low. Too low usually we'll say is you know in the 90s with symptoms or under 90. Um, you know we don't like it going into in the 80s if that's not your normal baseline blood pressure. Okay and. For the swelling in the legs, compression stockings are great. I, I'm a big advocate of compression stockings in general. Yes, I love it. Okay. <laughs> Shit, you can't see, but she has really cute ones on. Okay, so yeah, compression stockings, they make really cute. So Amazon will make these really, like I've done that too. So Bombas makes really nice compression stockings. They hold up well in the wash, so a little bit more expensive. Bombas, um, they've lasted me years. And then the Amazon, you know, they make athletic compression stockings. They're less expensive. Um, and you don't need to do the full like 30 millimeters or this really, really tight, but just a little bit of compression, see how much you can handle. Um, that can be helpful for leg swelling in general. And then you start with a low dose if you can, and then increase gradually. So, um, you know, what is a low dose? You talk to your doctor, but usually we start at the lower end of the dosing range and just work our way up. And if your symptoms are really well controlled, let's say you move from Chicago and you move to LA, okay, well, maybe you can come off your medications. So if there's something that's changed in your lifestyle, you know, maybe you're working from home where you're not in that air conditioned office anymore. Maybe you could come off your medications. You know, you had a couple good years, no ulcers. And then maximize your non-medication hand warming measures. <laughs> I love this, this the interactions. So we've got the hot hands here, the chemical hand warmers. They make the USB rechargeable ones. Those are pretty good. 
Amazon has a heated muffler. It's about $40. And that thing is awesome. You can charge your phone in it. And it looks, it's small and it looks really just, it, it is amazing. And then for people who are like serious outdoors people, you know, the NFL players, they use these GTAC heated pouches. They're pretty big, but, and they're like an oven. So you have to use a low setting if you're using it indoors, but the heated mufflers are really great. And then we'll start and, you know, check a chemistry panel. It's again, most people are getting chemistry panels anyway. Okay, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And they have the oral form of these. We're not talking about the topical form. Um, so ibuprofen, naproxen, diclofenac, meloxicam, ketorolac, celecoxib, which is Celebrex, aspirin. I would say most people are using all the ones except aspirin. We don't see commonly as much used, you know, except for cardiovascular risk prevention, but some people do use it. So potential benefits, they actually truly do, they're truly anti-inflammatory. They, you know, back before there were good rheumatoid arthritis medications like methotrexate, people were on ibuprofen for disease modifying because they actually do reduce inflammation. It's not just the pain pill. So for people with arthritis, they do have a biological effect. Um, they can treat headache, other aches and pains, and then you can potentially reduce joint damage and some types of inflammatory arthritis. So there's been studies showing people on these types of medications with ankylosing spondylitis have less bony fusion in their, in their spine. Um, and then specifically aspirin, typically we're using that to reduce cardiovascular risk. Okay, these are over the counter. It's again, when you, thought, when you talk about like, if you saw a commercial for ibuprofen, you would be pretty scared, right? And this is something you can go pick up at Walgreens um, because they can cause kidney damage. And again, dose dependent, it is real. You know, they can cause basically like an allergic um, kidney issue. Um, that can be pretty severe um, and it can cause liver damage. It's a really common reason that we see that the liver enzymes are elevated. Sometimes people are taking methotrexate and they get their labs checked, their liver enzymes are elevated and it's not the methotrexate, but it's the combination of the methotrexate plus the ibuprofen. Um, stomach upset, that's a big issue for scleroderma patients. And then elevated blood pressure, they can make you retain fluid. Um, and then cardiovascular risk, except aspirin. So basically they all increase your cardiovascular risk. And then bleeding risk, but especially aspirin increases your bleeding risk. And that's, you know, lasts about seven days, that bleeding risk. So, of course, there are many ways that we use to relieve pain. So try non-medication pain, pain relief methods, you know, physical therapy, assistive devices, you know, use that cane if you have hip arthritis or knee arthritis. Um, you know, use that rollator if you need that rollator to try to get around with minimal pain. Um, you can try topical non steroidal anti-inflammatories. So there's Voltaren gel it has minimal absorption. So that's topical diclofenac. And, you know, it can go around the areas of painful joints. It works well for knees and hands, not so well for deep joints. So that could potentially be something that you might consider to try to reduce the orals and see if you can get that Voltaren to help work for those small joints. Do check your kidney and liver function periodically. That is, you know, pretty much for people on non steroidal anti-inflammatories to every six months is, you know, when I would say you have to have labs done because we want to make sure that the kidney function is okay. And take it with food to help minimize the stomach irritation. You know, some people with scleroderma, they're maybe only meeting, eating one or two good meals a day. There are non steroidal anti-inflammatories that have once a day formulation, right? So if you're like, I can only eat lunch because that's the only time I feel good. Maybe you need a once a day formulation so that you can eat it with food. Ibuprofen really is like a four to three to four times a day medication. And most people are not eating a big meal three to four times a day. Um, don't take without alcohol just increases the risk of liver enzyme abnormalities, can increase stomach upset. And then use the lowest possible dose for the shortest period of time. It's a good principle for everything, right? If you don't need it, don't take it. They are as needed medications usually. And so usually we're saying, if it doesn't help you, it probably doesn't need part to be part of your regimen. Okay. So steroids. Okay. Um, so steroids. So examples would be prednisone, methylprednisolone, which sometimes you'll see as a medrol dose pack dexamethasone, decadron, hydrocortisone. Um, hydrocortisone is usually more for blood pressure support in people with uh, adrenal glands that are not functioning at optimal level. Betamethasone, triamcinolone, you see betamethasone and triamcinolone more often as injectables. Okay, so they're to treat serious autoimmune inflammation in kidneys, lungs, heart, muscles, or organs. They're really, really vital medications. The steroids came out in I think the 50s. And they really were a game changer when they first came out because it really, there's nothing that works quite as fast for serious internal organ problems due to autoimmune disease as steroids. Um, they're lifesavers for people who really, really need them. 
They can help with symptoms related to inflammation from arthritis or other chronic inflammatory conditions. And then, um, you know, we do use them in certain other settings too, right? So, you know, if you were to get COVID, they would give you steroids if it was really, really severe to try to help reduce complications of it. So, you know, I don't want to um, be too negative on it, but it is in general for people with scleroderma, we really try not to put people on these medications. The main side effect, especially with people who are newly diagnosed with scleroderma and who have RNA polymerase three antibodies is that steroids can increase your risk of renal crisis. And this is real. So that's why you need that blood pressure cough, especially for people who are newly diagnosed, you check your blood pressure. If it's rising, that can be a sign of scleroderma renal crisis. And that can lead people to go on dialysis um, permanently. So, you know, especially if you're on steroids greater than 10 milligrams a day, you need to really be vigilant about checking your blood pressure. And even if you're not newly diagnosed, if you're on steroids, check your blood pressure, check your blood pressure. Okay. So weight gain, get a scale. If you're on steroids as well, check your weight a couple of times a week, you know, make sure that that's staying, you know, about where you want it to be. Osteoporosis. So osteoporosis, steroids will lower your bone density and increase your risk of fracture. So again, another reason to get a bone density test if you are on chronic steroids. Diabetes. Yeah, sometimes people get high sugars on steroids and they don't go away. They have diabetes permanently after they're on steroids. Cataracts, you know, um, loss of muscle mass, they can cause basically, you know, this is not the kind of steroid that bodybuilders are on. That's, this is a, what we call catabolic steroid where it actually breaks down muscle tissue. Um, infection risk is increased on steroids and then general body fat re redistribution. So some people get body fat, like, um, like, uh, uh, excess body fat in the posterior neck area when they're on steroids and that can be permanent or around the collarbones to get excess fat. So minimizing the risks of steroids, it's a recurring theme, use the lowest dose for the shortest period of time, lowest dose for the shortest period of time. So if you really need steroids and, you know, assuming you have a conversation with your doctor, you really need them you know, you really want to have a plan for how do I get off these? Use steroid sparing medications for scleroderma instead whenever possible. So if you have arthritis, you know, lung disease, we have things like ectoma that can treat arthritis and lung disease. Um, so there's lots of different options that we have that can help minimize that role for steroids. Monitor your blood pressure, monitor your weight. And if applicable, your blood, usually people are not getting a home glucose monitor, home sugar check when they are on steroids. Um, but typically you're going to see on that chemistry panel too, that you're going to see that there's a random glucose level and that you can use that as a guide as well. Um, and then we'll often check an A1C, which is the long-term measure of glucose blood sugar control when people are on steroids. See the eye doctor. Yeah. Really important when you're on steroids and they can monitor you. If you have cataracts, you can have those removed and then make sure you're attentive to all the bone health things, you know, the bone density scan, exercise, calcium, vitamin D. And if you're on high doses of steroids and everybody's threshold for where to start this medication is different. And so people often at the thresholds around 15 to 20 milligrams or higher, you may need an antibiotic to prevent a serious infection called PCP that we see in immunocompromised patients. Um, often this is a medication called it's Bactrim three times a week. But again, that's something that, you know, just this is a conversation to have with your doctor, right? Okay. So this is where I probably should have broken this up in a couple different spots, but we will have some time for questions. Um, so disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. So methotrexate, mycophenolate monophotil, azathioprine, tocilizumab, which is ectomer, rituximab, hydroxychloroquine, lots of benefits. So we love these medications because they help minimize or eliminate steroids, really, really important because steroids are so bad for the body. Um, they can help reduce inflammation in joints, like for example, methotrexate, azathioprine, tocilizumab, rituximab, hydroxychloroquine, not so much mycophenolate, it's not a great arthritis medication. Um, they can help soften skin. Nothing is FDA approved to treat scleroderma skin, but many patients find many of these medications helpful. A lot of clinical trials for scleroderma miss their endpoint on skin. They've met their endpoints on lungs, two trials, um, but skin has been a tougher measure to really prove that something's effective, but many of these people will notice benefits, right? They can help, um, reduce certain skin rashes. So if you have other conditions like dermatomyositis, sometimes some of these medications can help with that. They can help reduce lung inflammation, reduce the risk of lung fibrosis. That's really important. So almost all these medications will increase your risk of infection, except hydroxychloroquine that is, does not increase your risk of infection. Um, and that is something that you, if you have an infection, you can continue your hydroxychloroquine. Um, elevated liver enzymes, 
I would say the biggest culprits there would be methotrexate, azathioprine, and tocilizumab, not generally rituximab, mycophenolate, or hydroxychloroquine. Um, low blood counts, um, almost all of them can do that, except for we don't see it commonly with hydroxychloroquine or rituximab. Um, cancer. Anything that lowers your immune system, remember your immune system is really important for protecting you against cancer. So people with low immune systems get more cancers like skin cancer or cervical cancer. And so yes, people with scleroderma have an overactive immune system. We're trying to calm it down so that the scleroderma doesn't cause damage, but lowering your immune system typically will definitely increase your risk of skin cancer. So it's something um, you know, we're very, very aware of. Um, and then a specific side effect from hydroxychloroquine is retinal toxicity. So retinal toxicity, it's usually has no symptoms associated. Um, and that risk we'll say is after five years of use, about 1% of people per year will get that retinal side effect that the ophthalmologist says stop the medication. Okay. And then GI complications for some of these. So mycophenolate, again, common culprit for diarrhea. Azathioprine can cause a fair bit of stomach upset as well. Methotrexate too. Um, and then really rare risk, tocilizumab is bowel perforation. I've never seen it. I don't care to see it. But it's something with people with serious like inflammatory bowel disease, we don't use tocilizumab, ectomab, because of that risk of bowel perforation, people with bowel inflammation at baseline. All right. So general concept how to, to reduce the risk. So screen for infections. In our center, you cannot prescribe these unless your our pharmacists see that your TB and hepatitis are up to date. So, you know, I can get insurance to authorize it, but our pharmacy will not release the medication unless those are up to date. Really, really important. Um, and that's almost everything. Now, hydroxychloroquine, you don't need to do that, but almost everything else you will need to screen for hepatitis and TB. Okay, get monitoring labs on schedule. Often, most of these medications we're doing every three to four month comprehensive metabolic panel and a complete blood count. Hydroxychloroquine, you don't really need monitoring labs. Um, and then stop the medication, notify your doctor immediately if signs or symptoms of infection develop. Always a good idea, right? You have the flu, you know, let's say you test positive for COVID, you have a fever, you think you have a urinary tract infection. I, I, I kid you not, one of the things we see commonly is an animal bite. I, it's the strangest thing, but people get bitten by cats on the hands and those are nasty. So if you get bitten on the hand by an animal, you need antibiotics immediately and you need to stop your medications if it's immune suppressive and then get your recommended vaccinations. Okay. So the conversation with your doctor would be, you know, what are the most common side effects of this medication? What are the most serious side effects? How can we monitor for that? If I stop the medication because of a side effect, will the side effect go away? It's really important to know, right? Like some of these side effects, you know, is this gonna be permanent if, you know, if I get the side effect? Cause that's gonna change your calculation. And what can we do to minimize the risk? Okay, and then vaccinations, okay. Vaccination, so infections can be very, very risky for people with scleroderma. And being hospitalized in general is bad. So people get hospitalized and they put you in a bed for however long you're in there and people come out and they're weak, right? So it can lead to lots of negative outcomes, difficult, you know, you may need to go to physical therapy, you may need to go to rehab, have some complication there. So as much as you can do to minimize being hospitalized, that is a, note, a really important goal. And infections can cause disease flares and they can make you come off your medications. So risks of infection, you know, shingles, for all of us who've had chicken pox as a kid, the younger generation is really lucky, you know, they you know, have been vaccinated, but for almost all of us, we've had chicken pox as a kid, and that increases your risk of shingles. And you can have permanent lung damage, so COVID, flu, RSV, bacterial pneumonia. And then don't forget too about the risks of, you know, for all the caregivers in the room too, you know, it's not just about us, it's about who we're with, right? So, you know, I may get the flu and I may be fine, but that's why all healthcare providers, we have to be vaccinated. I, I wouldn't be able to work if I didn't get my flu vaccine because it's not, they don't care about me. They just care about the patients, right? And it is as they should. Um, so, you know, and we forget things like whooping cough, you know, whooping cough has come back because people's immunity has waned and it may be fine for us to get whooping cough, but those babies, they're not vaccinated. And a whooping cough in a real, a very young baby can be very, very dangerous. So common vaccines. So, you know, these are the things that many of our patients are getting. The annual flu vaccine, the COVID vaccines, booster, if it's been at least four months, we are seeing COVID cases rise in Chicago at least. And so it is something we're recommending people get their boosters now. Tdap booster, if it's been at least 10 years. 
um, pneumonia vaccine. So almost everyone ages 65 and up, and then people under, it's almost everyone with Sturgeon should be getting the pneumonia vaccine because that is a risk factor. And then shingles vaccine, people aged 15 up um, and selected people younger than 50, although it can be harder for insurance to cover it when you're under 50. And then RSV vaccine, they did change the recommendations. Um, and so it used to be, it was when it came out, it was 60 and up and now it's 75 and up and then 60 to, to 74 with certain risk factors. So talk to your doctor about RSV vaccine. So there is actually CDC, I don't think this is well publicized because nobody has ever brought this up, but there actually is, there's a couple tools that you can use to decide what vaccines you need. So if you go to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control website, they will have a vaccines page. There is an app. So the Pneumorex Vax Advisor app, and then there's the adult vaccine assessment tool. And so the website is there and I think the slides are gonna be posted, but you can go there and you can actually look and see what vaccines that you need. So live attenuated vaccines, most things that we give are not live. So these are you know, special vaccines like the measles, mumps, rubella. Most of us got as a kid, there are some special situations where you might need that as an adult. Yellow fever, you know, if you're traveling certain places. Sostavax, we don't usually give that. We've, that's been more replaced by the Shingrix. So those are two forms of shingles vaccine. But you can't get these if you are on immunosuppressant, vaccine, uh, immunosuppressant medications. So if you need to get one of these, you need to talk to your doctor about how to stop it and for how long. The American College of Rheumatology does put out some guidelines, although your doctor may have a variation from those guidelines. Okay. Common side effects for vaccines would be pain and swelling at the site of the injection, fevers, really common, it's an immune response. Body aches, especially that second dose of shingles vaccine, the shingrix, oh yeah, it's, it's rough. Um, you know, most people say it's better than getting shingles. So, you know, but you just have to prepare yourself. And then really rare neurologic syndrome, Guillain-Barre. Okay, this is an example. I see this all the time. Actually, I had a, a, a medical assistant do one of my flu vaccines and I actually had to move her hand, right? So she was going for my subdeltoid bursa, which is a bursa in your shoulder. That is not an effective place to give a vaccine and that hurts. So subdeltoid bursitis can cause really prolonged shoulder pain after vaccine. If you see somebody going too high, you can move their hand. You wanna go in the meat of the, the arm where you have muscle. This is an intramuscular injection. And in general, it's always a good, if you can get your vaccines on a Friday, it's great, right? If you don't work on the weekends um, and you know don't get it the day before wedding or something like that. And then, you know, American Culture Rheumatology says you can get them at once. I've seen a lot of people, it seems like people have more side effects when they get them on the same day. So you might want to schedule them a week apart. This is not, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, right? We're trying to get our vaccines and not get too sick. And then you can use Tylenol to reduce fever. So in certain situations, you may want to hold your medications to get more out of your vaccines. Talk to your doctor about whether you should do that. And if they need help, there is this uh, paper and it's the American College of Rheumatology publishes guidelines for what medications that you might want to do this for to get more out of your vaccines. You don't need to hold everything and not everybody should hold. And then the COVID vaccine. Um, so it, people always ask about COVID vaccines flare. You know, I think a lot of people in this room are, you know, they're, you know, on board with getting their vaccines, but it is, um, I think it's a legitimate concern. It's about a 7% risk of autoimmune disease flare after COVID vaccination. Most flares are mild and flares are more likely to occur one to two weeks after vaccination. And if your symptoms are not controlled at baseline. Okay, so infections are really dangerous. You know, you have to weigh the risks, you know, you know, pain, you know, fevers, all these things against what happens if I get this infection or what happens if I give it to somebody else, which a lot of these things have serious consequences. And for family, yeah, family get your vaccines too, you know, and if somebody doesn't want to get vaccinated, try to get everybody else around it. You know, it's a herd, you know, try to get everybody that you can um, to protect, you know, the person who needs protection. And then talk to your doctor about how, when to get vaccinations, and then you can reference the CDC if needed.